The Shtei Halechem. I'll now give you a little uh, bit of fact that I bet you, I shouldn't boast about this, I bet you you can ask any of your Shabbos hosts and they will not, they will give you the wrong answer. And that is, we have the holiday of Shavuos coming up. And one of the names of Shavuos is Chag Habikurim, the holiday of the first fruits. So ask most people in the world, why is Shavuos called the holiday of Bikurim? And the answer they will give you is because there's a mitzvah every year in Eretz Yisrael, when there was a Beis HaMikdash, to bring the first fruits, actually it's not only fruit, it's the seven species, uh, bring the very first ones to the Beis HaMikdash and put it down in front of the Mizbeach and recite the history, the brief history of the Jewish people and then give it to the Kohen and the mitzvah of bringing Bikurim is on Shavuos and therefore it is called the Chag of Bikurim. So I'm here to tell you that that is wrong. That is not the reason why it is called Chag of Bikurim. Uh, it is called Chag of Bikurim because the Shtei Halechem is the first mincha from the new grain that allows you to bring other menachas from the new grain. So it is not referring to the mitzvah of the farmer to bring his first fruits. It is referring to the communal korban of the shtei halechem that matirs, it's the first because it now matirs the other ones. In point of fact, bikorim cannot be brought on shvos because Bikurim are a private offering. Bikurim are a private thing that a person brings. You don't bring them on Yom Tif. Rather, the only relevance of Shavuos to Bikurim is that Shavuos, really the day after Shavuos, is the start of the Bikurim season, when people would bring their first fruits, and they would bring it throughout the summer. So there is actually nothing specifically that ties the holiday of Shavuos to the individual mitzvah of Bikurim, uh, the reference to Bikurim is the Shtei HaLechem. Again, uh, that is something that many, many, many people do not know. So here in Or Sameach, we give you uh, privileged information that is not known by many people. Okay, <laughs> but be it as it may, uh, yeah. Just really quickly, Bikurim is only to the Shiva Minyan? That's correct. Oh, no, nothing else. That's correct. Now, there is something that's called Itur Bikurim, adornment of the Bikurim, where you could add other fruits, but the Chiyav of Bikurim is only Shiva Saminum. Now again, let me just uh, point out, as is obvious, that unlike things like Truma and Miser, that we still separate today, although we don't give it to a Kohen because they're Tameh, Bikurim we don't do it all. Bikurim is one of the mitzvos that is linked to a Beis HaMikdash. So when there's no Beis HaMikdash, we do not bring Bikurim, even rabbinically. Truma, Maser, that we do. Machlokas is a Doraisa or Drabanan. Bikurim we Bichlal do not do today. However, there is one part of the Bikurim ceremony that's very much part of our liturgy, and that is it is the foundation of the Haggadah of Pesach. Because you'll recall uh, in Parshas Kisava, when a person brings Bikurim, so he declares, Lavan the Aramean wanted to destroy my father, my father went down to Mitzrayim, and we were only a small number. Those psukim, the four psukim of what a person says when they bring Bikurim is the structure of the Haggadah of Pesach. So in effect, we actually say those psukim uh, every year at the Pesach Seder. In fact, the Meshach Chachma says an interesting thing. The reason why Chazal chose those verses for the Haggadah is almost kind of a Gezei shava because the declaration begins, he got it the Hayom. I have declared today. So Chazal saw the use of that Lashon as a remez that that would be appropriate to the God of Pesach. So today I'm going to start a bit of a new topic, not, not, uh, not for too many sessions, just a little bit, because what's coming up in this week's Parsha, in Eretz Yisrael at least, Chutz Laaretz is you know, one Parsha behind. By the way, here's a question to think about, uh, just to think about this. Uh, why does it take so long to catch up? It actually doesn't make any sense. Why is there a discrepancy between Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Laaretz in Torah reading? For a very simple reason. And that is, whenever the last day of Yom Tif and Chutz Laaretz is on a Shabbos, Chutz Laaretz is going to be one Parsha behind. So for example, this year, the seventh day of Pesach, which is our last day, was Friday. And Shabbos was already after Pesach. 
So since Shabbos was already after Pesach, we read the Parsha of the week, which was Acharimos. But in Chutz Oretz, right outside of Israel, Shabbos was the eighth day of Pesach. So they read the Yom Tov, a Yom Tov reading. And as a result, they were one Parsha behind us. Right, that's why people have to catch up, etc. And uh, the question is, how long will they be behind us? When will they be caught up? And the answer is they'll be caught up at the end of Sefer Bamidbor, in which when we're up to Parshas Masai and they're up to Parshas Matos, they will read Matos and Masai together. They'll have a double Parsha then, and then we will be caught up. Now that's uh, close to Tisha B'av. Now the question is, why couldn't they handle it at the very mm -hmm. beginning? Because Achare Mos and Kedoshim, many years, are in fact joined together. So what could have happened was, we read Achare on the day after Pesach. They read Yom Tif. So next week when we read Kedoshim, when we read Kedoshim, they could have read Achare Mos and Kedoshim. And that is a parsha, two parshas that are commonly combined on a non-leap year. So it's a really, really big kasha that even if you want to say, we don't want to combine parshas that are normally not combined, even that's not a problem, I mean, why can't you? But okay, let's say you only want to combine the standard combinations. Acharimos and Kedoshim is a standard combination. So uh, why couldn't they catch up right then? So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have a good terrorist. I, I I've seen, people try to answer this with answers that were frankly so complicated, I could not follow it myself. I'm gonna to have to go back and look at it. But L'Chaira, it is a good kasha. The catch-up is not gonna be until uh, close to Tisha B'Av, when in fact we could have caught up right away. Yeah. It's brought down as the minog. The minog is to be mechaber them in the, uh, in the summer. It's brought down as a minag. Now, now the there's no halachic principle. I mean, you can combine parshas anytime you want. So, this is vadai, not a halacha that prohibits. But uh, you now we like to be in sync because when people travel back and forth, we want to minimize the missing of parshios. So, logically, it would appear the minag should be to try to uh, coordinate the parshios as early as possible. And Achari Mos would have literally been the first week uh, this, this could have been fixed, and yet we're dragging it out. Now, in terms of halacha, by the way, let's say you're a traveler and you wind up missing a parsha. So Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach actually says, although we did make it up, we did read two parshios or for people returning for Pesach, etc. But Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach says there's actually no chiyav to catch up. Uh, you know, you have a chiyav to hear the Torah read every Shabbos. As long as, you know, every Shabbos, you hear Kriya Satora, the fact that you didn't hear a Parsha, whatever it is, is not a Chiyav. You don't have a direct Chiyav as an individual to hear every Parsha. You have a Chiyav to hear Kriya Satora. The Tzibor, has, as a minion, has a Chiyav to do a new Parsha every week. So according to Shlomo Zalman, there was no obligation Bichlau to uh, read a double Parsha for the people who missed uh, a Kriya or the like, all right, the I guess we do it, but uh, he actually said uh, there was no such, uh, no such obligation, but okay. Alrighty, uh, but given the fact that in Eretz Yisrael, at least, the Parsha that we're reading is Bahar, and by the way, Bahar B'chukas, that would also be something that Chutzlars, they could connect, but okay, but there, there are many, many opportunities that they pass up before they get to Matos and Masai, but okay. But in Parsha's Bahar, we do have a very important mitzvah that's very Nogea this year, and that is the mitzvah of Shemitah. So uh, obviously we're a little bit towards the tail end of Shemitah, but it's still good to talk about, especially since some halachas of Shemitah are actually going to be more relevant in the eighth year than they are right now. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, a very, very interesting phenomenon. We have two sabbatical years. We have a Shemitah year, which is every seventh year. And then we have the Yovel year, the Jubilee year, that is the 50th year. And uh, the question becomes, when you had a Yovel, we don't have Yovel today, and we'll talk about why, how does Yovel coordinate with Shemitah? Let's say you're counting Shemitah, one, two, three, four, five, six, Shemitah. One, two, three, four, five, six, Shemitah, right? So then you have 49 years. 
The 50th year is a Yovel. The question is, is the 50th year also year one towards the new Shemitah cycle? Meaning, is year 50 a year one and you simply continue counting? Or is year 50 like a zero year? It's a zero placement and you start counting afterwards. This is actually a machlokas in the Gemara. I'm not going to go through all of the opinions in the Gemara, but the bottom line is Yovel is a place setter, meaning to say Yovel is a zero, meaning you count 49 years, seven Shemitah cycles, then you have a Yovel. After Yovel, you start with year one. However, this is true only when Yovel is observed. When Yovel is not observed, we take it out of the equation and we just continuously count seven years. Bisman Hazeh, Yovel is not observed. Shemitah is observed. Yovel is not observed. Why is Yovel not observed? Why is there no Yovel today? I mean, we could try to find out what year would be a Jubilee year. I mean, it's possible to find it out, but it's not observed. There is no observance of the Jubilee year. So first of all, what are the halachas of Yovel? Just to be aware. So number one, they overlap with Shemitah. You can't plant, you can't plow. I can't harvest, but Yovel has some additional laws, and that is that all real estate that was sold in Eretz Yisrael goes back to the original owners, and all slaves, if they're slaves, go free. That's unique to Yovel. There is no Yovel today, because since the language of the Torah when it describes Yovel is ukrasem duror l'chol yoshveha. You shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. I'm not sure if I have the right English translation, but if those words sound vaguely familiar, they are on the Liberty Bell in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. Proclaim liberty throughout the land. That is the lesson of the Torah. Ukrasem teror l'chol yoshveha. So notice the words l'chol yoshveha. All of the inhabitants. Chazal have a drasha, you only keep Yevel when all of the Jewish people, and some say most of the Jewish people, are living in Eretz Yisrael. And when most of the Jewish people are not living in Eretz Yisrael, there is no obligation to observe Yevel. Now, people are raising interesting questions. For most of our history, most of the Jewish people were not living in the land of Israel. In fact, during the Second Temple period, even when there was a Beis HaMikdash, there was no Yovel in the Second Temple period. Can you imagine that? Even when there was a Beis HaMikdash. And not only that, but even in the first Beis HaMikdash, after the ten tribes were exiled, most of the Jewish people were not living in Eretz Yisrael. So we haven't had Yovel for a really, really long time. It's not just after the Chorban Beis Amikdash. We didn't have it in the Bayes Sheni, and we didn't have it in the Bayes Rishon after the Ten Tribes were exiled, which was over 100 years before the Chorban Bayes Rishon. Okay? Therefore, there's no Yovel. But once there's no Yovel, the calculation of Shemitah becomes different. In other words, Shemitah, since the abolition of Yovel, will get progressively earlier and earlier in the cycle than it was when there was Yovel. Meaning when there was Yovel, every 50 years you had a zero, so Shemitah was pushed forward one year. Once you no longer keep Yovel, Shemitah is calculated simply by seven, 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 seven. There is no interruption in the countings of sevens. So that would mean that Shemitah by now would actually be many years earlier than it would have been in the Bayes Rishon had you still had a, a Yovel. Okay, you understand the difference because when there is a Yovel, Yovel is a year zero that pushes Shemitah later. 
when there's no Yovel, there is no year zero. The whatever would have been the Yovel, yeah, we could find it out, but it's not no Gael Halacha. Whatever would have been the Yovel year just becomes year one of the next Shemitah cycle, right? So it is important to know, therefore, that uh, Shemitah Bizman Hazeh, not just Bizman Hazeh, ever since the abolition of Yovel in the time of the Ten Tribes is earlier than it would have been. And of course, in the course of time, that also means you'll have uh, more Shemitos in the cycle. Meaning if you took, let's say, if you took hundreds and hundreds of years, which had Yovels, you would have X number of Shemitas. But if you take those same hundreds of years without Yovels, you're going to have more Shemitas. So the truth of the matter is, we, we have more Shemitas within a given number of years than would have been the case in the Bias Rishon when you had a Yovel. Okay, now, the interesting question people raise is this. So you're telling me there's no Yovel because most of the Jewish people are not living in Eretz Israel. Well, for most of the time that was the case. But today, uh, the truth of the matter is people actually say that we are approaching something very, very close to 50% of the Jewish people living in the land of Israel. So the question becomes, if we cross over the 50% mark, is that going to bring back Yovel? Now, I tell you, if Yovel comes back, life is going to be enormously complicated. Baruch Hashem, we don't have that many slaves that have to be freed. That's not going to be the issue. But giving back land to the original owners I mean, do you remember, uh, I think a few years ago, maybe, maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, there were some uh, descendants of the Indians who sold Manhattan Island for $24 of beads, right? <laughs> and uh, they claimed it was a Mecca toast. They said it was an inadequate price. And they wanted to get back to Manhattan Island. <laughs> they brought a lawsuit to reclaim Manhattan Island. Well, you're going to have a very similar problem when Yeovil comes back. Uh, some guy who can trace his yichas to the tribe of Zavulin is going to want that Tel Aviv beach strip with all of the hotels. And there's going to be a very, very, very complicated question of how you sort out original ownership. Of course, that also raises interesting halakhic questions. Well, wait a second. If I sell you empty land and you build a hotel and Yovel comes up, do I get the hotel for free? So the, the truth is, no, I, I don't get the hotel for free, meaning I get the lands, but if I want the hotel, uh, I got to pay for it. Or I can tell you to demolish it. That's interesting. So that gives me a certain amount of leverage, meaning to say, hey, you built a hotel in my lands. So we got two choices. I do not get the hotel for free. That much is so. But I can either tell you to take it away or I pay you for it. So... I can imagine that that could be a basis for a negotiation and, and the like. So, uh, so there'll be a whole cadre of rabbinic lawyers who will have to be involved in land titles and uh, proving uh, and the like. But for a number of reasons, even if we hit the 51%, Yovel is not yet going to come back. And let, let me give you a few reasons. First of all, 51% of what? I mean, if the 10 tribes are lost, they haven't been reunited yet. So I mean, so yeah, 50% of, of people who identify as Jews, but there's all sorts of Jews who are lost. Uh, number two, uh, even without looking at the lost 10 tribes, there are plenty of people out there who don't identify themselves as Jewish and they might be Jewish. Uh, there was an organization, may still exist. It was called Ami Shav, my nation, Ami Shav, my nation is returning. And they went all over the world and they identified different groups that had been separated from the Jewish people. Perhaps they were part of the Lost Ten Tribes and they tried to bring them back to Eretz Israel. So they identified people in India, people in China, uh, people in Peru, all sorts of groups of Jews. So what was interesting is, you now they were finding 30 people here and 50 people here and 100 people here. And the state of Israel was very supportive. Bring them over, bring them over, let's settle it, let's, let's be Maccabets, all of the Goliath territory Israel. But then they came up with an idea that the 30 million members of the Pashtun tribe in Afghanistan, that's the largest tribe 
in Afghanistan. Now, they don't identify as Jewish, they're, they're Muslims. But according to the uh, historical research of Amishav, they were actually descendants of the Ten Tribes. And uh, therefore, they were halachically Jewish, and therefore they should come back to Israel under the law of return. This would be 30 million Afghanistan Pashtun. And it is interesting that they do have some Jewish customs, as strange as it is. They're not, they don't practice Judaism, and they don't, they don't consider themselves Jews. But number one, they do circumcision on the eighth day. Now, Islam does have circumcision. But like Ishmael, it'll be at 13 or maybe at uh, 8 or 10, but not, not at 8 days old. But this Pashtun is the only group, to, it's a big group, 30 million. They're the only group of Muslims that do circumcision at 8 days. Uh, they also observe a Yom Kippur fast, which is not part of the Islamic calendar. But that's their crazy tradition that they have Yom Kippur. And they have names that kind of resemble Hebrew sounding names. Rabani, Samani, Levaye, you know, different uh, things like that, which kind of suggests a Jewish origin. So I just want to say that the state of Israel was much less enthusiastic about that one, and they kind of dropped the funding when you're talking about, let's bring 30 million Afghanis, you know, into, into the state of Israel uh, to kind of uh, become part. So, so number one, therefore, just because you have 51% of people who identify themselves as Jewish, that is not a majority of the Jewish people. But number two, there's a more basic reason. When we say by Yovel, you need most of the Jewish people in Eretz Israel, it doesn't just mean they're here, but it means they're dwelling in their assigned tribal areas. In the times of Yeshua ben Nun, the land was divided. So you're in the land that, you know, you inherited, etc. And that we're not going to have because we really can't trace it. So even if you had all of the Jewish people, Mamish, in Eretz Yisrael, if there is no division according to tribal inheritance, there is no Yovel. So, so the bottom line is that we will not be able to observe Yovel essentially until Mashiach comes. Mashiach will identify what tribe you are and, and the land will be divided according to tribes. And then, indeed, the Ovel will become reinstituted. So you see in the Jerusalem Post, other newspapers that kind of heard this thing, that if most of the Jews are in Israel, uh, there's going to be Yovel. So every once in a while, the Israeli press likes to write a story about the uh, coming back of Yovel when you hit 51%. But that's uh, hyperbole, because in reality, there are other halachic problems, uh, such as not knowing the division of the land into tribal units in which we will not have Yovel till Mashiach comes. Yeah? Okay, so that's the next, right, so that's the next, I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay, so now, yeah? During the Bayashani? No, no, the bias, re well, 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 first of all, the bias Rishon was very simple because a hundred years before the bias Shani, uh, the bias Rishon, Sancheirev, the king of Ashur, exiled the ten tribes. They didn't have a choice. They were forcibly removed from Eretz Israel. So that itself already meant most of the Jews weren't in Eretz Israel. Now, what areas were Well, they were exiled from the northern kingdom, meaning the kingdom of Malchus Yisrael, uh, was uh, what we would call central and north Eretz Israel. Malchus Yehuda was centered around Jerusalem and south towards the Negev. Where were they exiled to? So they were exiled, uh, well, they were exiled primarily to, to Assyria. This would be to, uh, to Turkey, to uh, Asia Minor, various countries. Uh, there are some Midrashim that even say that some of them even got to Europe, to France and to... Uh, in fact, there's an old... Um, there's an old British tradition, I, 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 I'm trying to trace it, I, I can't find it so documented so well, that the royal, uh, the royal house of, of England, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth, these, those people, they trace their yichus to the tribe of Binyamin. Not Yehuda, not Yehuda. They have a shaykhus to the tribe of Binyamin. And this is based on the Targum Yenison, which is way before the Chorban, way before the exile of the Ten Tribes. This goes all the way back to Pilegesh Begiva in the time of the Shoftim. 
This is before there was a Beis HaMikdash. If you remember, there was a big war against the tribe of Binyamin, and they almost got uh, killed. Uh, and there's only a few of them left. And there's a contradiction in numbers. One gives a larger number, one gives a smaller number. And Targum Yainasen reconciles the numbers by saying the smaller number survived and remained in Eretz Israel. The larger number fled to Europe. So there was a tradition that even Christians uh, had that there was a certain remnant of the tribe of Binyamin that found itself in France and England even before there was a Beis HaMikdash. That's quite, that's quite uh, amazing. And the royal house claims that it has some of that blood. There's even something, there's something, I have to really check this, there's something in the British coronation ceremony that connects to the tribe of Binyamin. But, but that itself wouldn't change anything. Binyamin was only a small, was only one-twelfth. But the real reason why you don't have most of the Jews is because of uh, the ten tribes. Well, if the ten tribes were never reunited, then that's it. Uh, you, you never had it. But, but the truth is, most, most uh, Rishayim understand that even in the Malchus Shehuda, even in Yehuda and Binyamin, most did not return. And why didn't they return? That was considered an Avera. They were comfortable in Gullus. They didn't want to return. It's like today. You know, we don't return. Uh, we got used to it. So according to most Shittas, uh, even the remnant of Malchus Yehuda, right of them did not return. In the book of Ezra, it is recorded that 42,000 Jews returned to Eretz Israel when Cyrus gave them permission to rebuild the Bayat Sheni. Now, the problem is we know how many people returned, but we don't know how large the whole population was. That, that's the issue. But many say that the population was probably half a million. So if it was half a million, 42,000 is less than 10%. That is the standard understanding. So the standard understanding is that at least at the beginning of the Bayez Shani, only 10% returned. Ramban is cholek. Ramban does in fact say that uh, a majority of, but not the 10 tribes, but a majority of the two tribes did return. And for many, many years, I didn't understand that Ramban. I and mean, how can you say a majority if there's only 42,000 people who returned? But I actually saw a statistic that some say there only were around 70,000 Jews at the time of the Chorban. It's an amazing thing. We were hanging by a thread. There only were 70,000 Yidin. Uh, uh, well, not counting the 10 tribes, but in Eretz Yisrael. At the time of the Chorban by Yisrisha, there are some historians that say there were only 70,000 people. So if that's true, thank you, that really makes the Ramban very, very good. So basically it was 42,000 out of 70,000. That's a, that's a solid majority at that point. So I thought for many years, I, I just thought the Ramban didn't fit the historical picture. In point of fact, the Ramban might be, might be correct in this, yeah. When you mentioned that Chazal essentially got rid of observing Yovel, and instead we just do Shemitah every seven years, Shemitah, Shemitah, Shemitah. Yeah. Does that not pose halachic, uh, sorry, pose halachic problems with, like, doing too many Shemitahs? I mean, like, why, like you know, there's a Masoira, like, why wouldn't we use Yovel as, like, a placeholder? Like? No, no, because, because the halacha makes a lot of sense, meaning like this. Yovel is a placeholder because it has the status of Yovel. But when Yovel is Batel, when Yovel is... Remember, it's, it's not rabbinically... The Chazal didn't rabbinically abrogate Yovel. Yovel is abrogated by Torah law when most of the Jews are not living in Israel. So when Yovel is abrogated, the Shemitah count changes automatically. Now, let's talk about Shemitah, though, because as, as we know from this year, even though we do not keep Yovel, we still keep Shemitah. Now, here's the question. This is what you mentioned. Is the obligation to keep Shemitah today a Torah obligation? Or is it also a rabbinic obligation? So there are three opinions in the Rishonim. Again, all based on Gemaras, but we'll go the three opinions. Up. The most radical opinion is that of the Baal HaMaor, who is Bichlau, a very independent Risha, and the Balmar always like, says unusual things. He says, amazingly enough, 
<laughs> you don't have to keep Shemitah at all. It's not to arise, it's not to abundance. It's exactly like Yovel. <laughs> no Yovel, no Shemitah. And the fact that people keep Shemitah, it's a minog bialma. Okay, but that's the Balamor, and, and more or less, that does not enter the halachic discussion. Once in a while, they bring out the Balamor to, to be mitzitarifit to, to another shita for a kula, but we don't go with the Balamor. Okay, so the two other shitas are that there are shitos that say Shemitah bizman hazeh is the oraisa because Shemitah is not connected to Yovel and just because Yovel has a requirement of most of the Jews living in Eretz Yisrael, there is no such requirement for Shemitah. So the laws of Shemitah, not farming the land, etc., are Torah laws. That is opinion number two. Huh? Uh, this is that Tysus brings such an opinion. However, the third opinion, this is the Rambam and most Rishonim, most Rishonim say that Shemitah Bizman Hazer, and again, we'll define Bizman Hazer in a moment, is only Midrabana. Why is it, meaning Doraisa, there is no Shemitah? Because we compare Shemitah to Yovel. Whatever halacha applies to Yovel, applies to Shemitah. And if Yovel requires most of the Jews living in Eretz Yisrael, Shemitah also requires most of the Jews living in Eretz Yisrael. And that which we observe, Shemitah, is a midrabanan zecher lamikdash. Now we're going to see uh, shortly, maybe probably not today, that although obviously the fact that something's drabanan doesn't mean you don't keep it, you have to keep it, but we're going to see that there is a big, big significant difference if Shemitah has the chaymer of a doraisa mm -hmm. or the chaymer of a drabanan, and that will play out on whether you're allowed to rely on the heter of mechira to a guy. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this. I'll explain what it is, but you've, you've surely heard about this uh, over, over the years, that the Rabbanut uh, allows Shemitah to be evaded or avoided by selling land to non-Jews. And this is the famous or the infamous Heter Mechira. And I know that some people think Heter Mechira is like eating Chazer and it's Yeharag V'alyavar, I will die before I will eat Heter Mechira. It's, it's, not, it's not that bad, uh, but it's a controversial Heter. And you'll see, it will see, again, right now I'm not really fully explaining it, but you'll see that a lot of the Shakla Vitaria, can you rely on a Heter Mechira depends on whether Shemitah is rabbinic, in which case there are certain leniencies, or Shemitah is a Torah law, in which case you have to err on the side of strictness. That's why in Rav Kook's famous classic Sefer, Shabbat HaOretz, which is essentially his defense of the Hetra Mechira, uh, you will see that a lot of his pages are devoted to showing that the halacha is Shemitah, biz, not, not the Balamor, he doesn't go with the Balamor, but Shemitah Bizman Hazah is Midrabanan. Now, Tosvos, who also holds, there are two days in Tosvos, but the Shita in Tosvos that says Shemitah is Rabbanan asks a very interesting kasha. You're telling me that from the time of the exile of the ten tribes, there's no Shemitah and there's no Yovel, right? Because you don't have most of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael. But the Rabbanan brought back Shemitah to remember the Beis HaMikdash. So Frek Taisus, if the Rabbanan brought back, brought back Shemitah, why didn't they bring back Yovel? Why don't, why don't we have Bishlama if Shemitah's do raisa? So the Pshat is, Yovel went away and Shemitah's do raisa. But if you're telling me Shemitah and Yovel both went away, but the Rabbanan wanted to bring it back, Zechel Lamikdash. So Tosef asks, the same way they brought back Shemitah, Midrabanan, Zechel Lamikdash, they should bring back Yovel, Zechel Lamikdash. So why don't we have a rabbinic Yovel? We don't have a rabbinic Yovel. So Tosef gives an interesting answer, it's a little schwer, that the Chachamim didn't want to make a Takana where you couldn't work your fields for two years in a row. Because remember, Yovel comes after year 49 
Year 49 is a Shemitah year. It's divisible by seven. So when you had Yovel, there were actually two years in a row that you could not work your field. Year 49 was a Shemitah year, and year 50 was a Yovel. So when the Torah commands it, you got to do it. You don't have a choice. But when the Chachamim are making Takanos, they don't want to make a Takana that creates an extreme hardship of not working your fields for two years. Now, although this sounds like a very logical argument, in fact, some say it's very difficult. What do you mean a hardship? What type of hardship is there going to be? The Taira itself promises that if you don't work your land for Shemitah, and presumably Yevel as well, Hashem will give you extra crop. So what's the pshat? We don't want to make a hardship on the, on the seaboard. You don't believe in the Torah's bracha? So the interesting question is, and this is Nogaya today, is the Torah's bracha applicable when Shemitah or Yevel is only Drabana? Maybe the Haftacha of the Torah is when there's a Doraisa of Shemitah, then you get the bracha. But if Doraisa it's gone, maybe there is no bracha. And that, that itself is a very interesting discussion. Is there any type of guaranteed bracha when Shemitah is only Midrabanan? Interesting question. We do have stories. We do have some miraculous stories. On the other hand, we also find, I mean, people ask the question, we raise money for Shemitah farmers. We do all sorts of things. Uh, why are we raising money? Hashem's promise, right? <laughs> so there's a little bit of a proof, Taka, that when uh, it's a drabanan, you, you got to rely on hishtadlus, and you don't have this automatic bracha. And that would be the Hezbollah of Tosvos, why they didn't want to make a yovel midrabanan, because that would have been a hardship. Yeah. How is the drabanan of Shemit, Zecher, and Chorban, if what you're saying is that it has nothing really to do with a bit of Midash? You're, you're correct. I, I, I misspoke. Uh, so it's, you're, you're correct. It technically would not be a zecher le mikdash because even in the mikdash, Shemitah was not derisive. But it's a zecher to when we had not just the mikdash, but all of the Jewish people in Eretz Israel, that we should remember what that was. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, very good question, uh, because I'll tell you the problem, uh, you know, you're, you're hitting on a very good problem. Uh, Rashi says, maybe we'll go over this Rashi, that the reason the Golas of Bavel was 70 years is there were 70 Shemitos they didn't keep. But if you look at some of them, some of those 70 Shemitos were after the 10 tribes were exiled, in which case Shemitah, like many, would only be Midrabanan, and yet, you find that that's nichlal in the curses of the Gullah. So, that's a very good question. So, it turns out, Lagabi, the Klala, you'll get the Klala for not uh, keeping the Shemitah Drabanan, but maybe you won't get the Bracha. But well, we'll talk about it. Maybe it's Kadai probably to look at that Rashi to understand the chronology of it. Yeah. Um, if Tusha, if Shemitah is only Drabanan, then let me that all the fruits of Tusha and Shemitah only Drabanan also? That's correct. That's correct. Meaning, the Oraisa, there is no Shemitah here. Okay, uh, so again, most post I mean, Rav Cook is right on this. I mean, I mean, even even people who don't agree with the Hedra Mechira are moda that uh, Rov Poskim do say Shmita Bisman Hazer is mid Rabbanan, and Yovel we don't observe at all. Okay, so that's the so, so the two points I just wanted to get out today is number one the differential computation of Shemitah with Yovel without Yovel. Number two, uh, why is there no Yovel? And number three, three points, whether Shemitah Bismanazah is the Orisa or Jerabanan. Uh, so next week we'll talk a little bit about uh, what the Hetra Mechira is, why it works and why it doesn't work, meaning we'll look at the two uh, studim of, of the Hetra Mechira. Okay, see you next week.